All right, I'm going to call the Murfreesboro City Council. This is our regular uh, meeting that we have uh, for our workshop. It is March the 10th. We are in the Murfreesboro Municipal Airport Community Room. Um, we'll start with a prayer, and then we'll go into our pledge. I feel bad with me. Father, I thank you for this chance that we get to uh, come together. Uh, Lord, uh, I pray for those things that are said and those things that are unsaid, uh, for the many people who are working in our community to... Um, continue to fight the, the COVID pandemic. Um, I thank you for the decisions that have to be made and for the thoughtfulness, thoughtfulness that individuals are putting behind those. I pray that you give them wisdom, that you give them guidance, and most of all, that you give them the ability to make decisions that are free from, uh, free from noise and that decisions are, are uh, made in the best interest of our community. Lord, uh, we ask you to be with us as we're making decisions, uh, that you will give us um, clear eyes, that you'll give us uh, listening ears. And we thank you for all of those things, and we ask them in your name. Amen. Right. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Um, I had Darren Gore, I mean, Eric Tucker come up to me before the, uh, before the meeting asking if y'all had any questions on the January dashboard. We were going to move that up. Aaron, I'm just kidding. That we were going to move that up to uh, the beginning of the agenda. So um, just to, to make sure and, and take care of that if she had to leave early. Are there any questions on the January dashboard? No questions there. All right, Free to go. All right. And I think all everyone um, has received either an email or information or a, a call from Brenda uh, working on scheduling a, meet, a meeting on 101s for your budget. So if you've not been able to schedule that yet, um, please get in touch with Craig, Aaron, or Brenda. Also, I did not mention pursuant to the governor's executive order, um, we are still able to conduct meetings virtually. Um, so I think, Madeline, you're, you're on board with us, aren't you? Yes, I am, Mayor. All right. And, and she's more loud and clear here than the council chambers. So, Chad, wherever you are, <laughs> you've got that going. All right. So approval of council minutes November 5th through January 21st of 2021. Move for approval. <laughs> Motion and second. Ms. Wright, please call the roll. Vice Mayor Scales Harris. Aye. Mr. LaLance. Aye. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mr. Wright. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. All right. Um, Sam is going to be handling the property acquisition of 731 North Walnut Street. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, uh, afternoon, members of Mayor, members of Council. I am uh, standing in for Helen today, who had to be out unexpectedly. Before the meeting, I placed on your uh, desk a copy of the public notice regarding our consolidated plan uh, to let you know that that uh, consolidated plan will be out for public comment period. We'll also have a public review meeting at Patterson Park on at 5.30. Uh, PM Tuesday, March the 30th, and that'll be in uh, one of the rooms there at Patterson Park. The comment period will continue to remain open until April the 9th, at which time we'll close uh, the comment period and we'll take action on the uh, consolidated plan. This will set the direction for community development program for 2021 through 2025. And, uh, and it would also um, uh, incorporate some new funding that came to us from HUD. That's in the form of information. The actual agenda item today, uh, Greenhouse Ministries made an application, a qualifying application for assistance to purchase a home for the affordable housing rental program. The home's at uh, 713, I'm sorry, 731 North Walnut Street. Uh, home's in good shape. The property has not closed yet, but the city will be participating through the community development program an amount of $125,000 plus uh, minimum the uh, normal uh, and customary closing cost. Uh, recommend your approval. I'll be glad to answer any questions. <clears throat> Make the motion to move, approve. Second. Motion to second. Vice Mayor Scales Harris. Aye. Mr. Lalance. Aye. Mr. Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mr. Wright. Aye. Mayor McFarland. 
Thank you. Aye. Right. All right, we'll move into our workshop items. We have the potential renaming of Mercury Boulevard. Mr. Malamley. Good morning, Mayor McFarland and uh, council members. Pull up a map for you. Pleased to be here today at the uh, at the workshop. Back on February the fourth, um, Councilman Wade brought up the uh, the idea of renaming Mercury Boulevard to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, and directed staff to study the matter um, and then bring it back to uh, to council in the form of a report. We've since studied the matter. Um, included in your agenda materials is a draft report. Um, detailing um, the, uh, the potential renaming of Mercury Boulevard. And I'll go over some, some background information with you. And um, uh, I think your next steps, if you, if you choose to move forward, would be to refer the matter back to the Planning Commission, as the Planning Commission has, uh, according to the city subdivision regulations, has final authority over street naming issues within the city of Murfreesboro. So just a little bit of background, Mercury Boulevard, um, based on the research that I've done, was constructed, phase one was constructed in the early to mid 50s. And phase one was from Southeast Broad Street over to what is now known as uh, Lassiter Drive. Phase two was subsequently constructed at some point beyond that from Lassiter Drive to South Rutherford Boulevard. Uh, it, Interestingly, I found a, a plat from uh, 1945, from before Mercury Boulevard was constructed, that actually shows a Washington Street in the location of where Mercury Boulevard is located now, near Carver Avenue. So presumably, um, both of those streets named for George Washington Carver. Um, so the Mercury Boulevard right-of-way was actually um, located on, the lo on where Washington Street was previously located, uh, and that is uh, in the area of, uh, of the Patterson Park Community Center. So Mercury Boulevard, as you know, is a, a uh, four-lane, uh, median-divided uh, uh, roadway um, that runs from Southeast Broad Street. And most people think that, it, that it, the street name Mercury Boulevard terminates at, at South Rutherford Boulevard. Um, but what many people don't know, except for those who might have addresses beyond that point, is there's about a 600-foot stretch of Mercury Boulevard that goes to the east of South Rutherford Boulevard. So there are actually, there's actually an apartment complex located on the north side of, of, of that stretch of Mercury Boulevard and the Circle K located on the south that both have Mercury Boulevard addresses. So in studying this, what, uh, what we determined would be the best course of action um, if the renaming moves forward would be to rename uh, Mercury Boulevard to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard up to South Rutherford Boulevard. And this actually gives us a good opportunity to clean up the uh, inconsistency of having that 600 foot stretch beyond South Rutherford Boulevard named um, Mercury Boulevard. We can actually, we could rename that 600 foot segment to John Bragg Highway. And what we, what we know from, from our emergency service providers is that having a defined point at which a street name changes, as opposed to a more less conspicuous location like 600 feet beyond, beyond South Rutherford Boulevard, it is less confusing for, for emergency service providers and for the, the general motoring public. And, and in my report, one of the things that I mentioned, just kind of as an aside, was it's that it's likely that most people actually think that the Mercury Boulevard street name actually stops at Rutherford Boulevard, even though, even though it doesn't. So the, um, as I mentioned, the city subdivision regulations give the Planning Commission final authority over street names. We've historically held public hearings for street name changes um, as, as a matter of custom, although we're not aware of anywhere where that's legally required. Um, but if you, if you remanded this item back to the Planning Commission, so to speak, we would expect that there would be a public hearing held before the Planning Commission um, because 
Uh, you know, renaming a street and readdressing properties has a very tangible impact on the uh, on the on the property owners and the and the tenants. In an effort to clarify when renaming a street is appropriate, the Planning Commission adopted the following policy in January of 2019. It shall be the policy of the City of Murfreesboro Planning Commission to rename existing streets only when a legitimate public interest is served and only when it promotes the public health, safety, and welfare of the community as a whole, e.g. in conjunction with a road construction project or to eliminate confusion for emergency service providers. The Planning Commission shall not endorse street renaming requests that do not meet this standard. So we, uh, so in the in the process of, of conducting this study and, and, and writing this report, made contact with um, several service providers, um, including Rutherford County Emergency Communications District, more commonly known as E911, uh, MPD and MFRD. MPD and MFRD both. Um, uh, Neither one thought it would be a hindrance to their to them continuing to provide their high level of services. As a matter of fact, they thought that 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 uh, the idea of breaking the street name at South Rutherford Boulevard would actually be a help to them in in, in reducing the amount of confusion. Uh, we um, corresponded with E911. The Martin Luther King. Uh, Junior Boulevard street name is not taken anywhere else in the county um, and could be implemented. The, uh, the adding the doctor in front of it, um, they have indicated that's doable. Uh, the only potential conflict that might that might arise from that is that the the coincident nature of the DR abbreviation with the DR abbreviation for drive. Um, so so in the data input of of um, uh, dispatchers putting in uh, addresses, uh, there's a, a small chance of confusion between those two, but they think that that, that will be a, a workable situation with the, with the doctor uh, title in that street name as well. As far as the, um, as far as the impact on property owners, um, there are a, a little over 400 addresses that would be impacted. By this, uh, by this renaming, um, approximately 360 of those are residential. Um, a large chunk of those come from the apartment complex that's on the other side of South Rutherford Boulevard. So that's live there about 200 units in that in that apartment complex. Uh, the balance of the of the 400 addresses, there are about 40 commercial and institutional addresses that would be impacted, uh, including several. Addresses by the uh, of the city's properties, including the fire station, Patterson Park. Um, but as with any as with any street name change and address change, um, you know there are some there are some growing pains for the uh, for the people who have addresses along that segment. But what we do as staff, um, we try to minimize those growing pains so that by taking the steps that we take, and the, and this would not be the first time that we've that we've renamed a street. Um, uh, you know, in the past, uh, there was a major, there were major street renaming undertakings with the Middle Tennessee Boulevard renaming, the Veterans Parkway renaming. So staff takes care of notifying all of the, all of the uh, service providers, uh, utilities, emergency services, post office. We take care of all that. Really, what the individuals would be responsible for would be notifying anybody that they do business with, customers, friends, relatives, creditors, things like that. As far as uh, uh, the consistency with the subdivision regulations and the, and the uh, Planning Commission street renaming policy, it's staff's position that, that uh, the request would be consistent with the Planning Commission's policy. Um, for the reasons why I've mentioned breaking the street name at, uh, at Rutherford Boulevard. Also, there is a, um, there's a Mercury, Mercury Drive in Laverne. Now, the address ranges of the two streets are not coincident, um, but still, we duplication of street, name, of street names, there's always the chance that there could be uh, confusion, even though the numbers are not, are not coincident. So it would achieve that goal. And also, beyond, the, beyond these items for, for um, public safety, 
is the reason the, the street name was brought up in February, which is to honor the substantial contributions of Dr. King um, and the advancements of civil rights in our nation, um, and that this renaming would achieve a public good, um, which, which staff believes uh, does meet the test that's, that's in the Planning Commission's street renaming policy. Um, so what we would, uh, as, far as, as far as next steps, if the City Council decides to move this forward, uh, it would be uh, moved to the Planning Commission. We would um, uh, put it on the Planning Commission's April 17th, or excuse me, April 21st day meeting agenda to schedule a public hearing. And uh, that, that public hearing would likely be held the first Wednesday in, in May. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions about, uh, about the street renaming, the process that we undertake, or anything else that you may have questions about. Any questions for Mr. Blomley? Is approval, it will never come back to us. Is that correct? That's correct. If the planning commission level changes. Yes, sir. That, so, so you'd be making a recommendation for planning commission to take this item up. If the planning commission approves the matter after it conducts a public hearing, then staff would determine an implementation date. Um, typically the implementation date, we would give um, property owners and residents of the area two to three months in order to be able to, to make the changes that they would have to make. Um, and in order for service providers to be able to uh, adjust the, the records in their databases and for our, uh, and for Mr. Kerr and his team to, to change out the street signs and things like that. <clears throat> Any questions? If not, I make a motion that we send this on to uh, Planning Commission for further study and seeing if we can get this street renamed. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Ms. Wright, please call the rule. Vice, <clears throat> Vice Mayor Skills Harris. Aye. Mr. Lance. Aye. Mr. Martin. Aye. Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Way. Aye. Mr. Wright. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. Can I, bring, can, I, can I ask a question on this just real quick? This is just a, uh, and to add to that, and I didn't want to bring it up during discussion for that particular item on the agenda, but would it be, I mean, I, I just went through this in Planning Commission last week where we renamed a little bit of memorial out here, uh, out to VA. I called, I called one of the people who lives there and just talked to them afterwards to kind of say, you know, basically sorry because his, his place of business has actually changed maybe three times in the last 20 years, back and forth between Redmond Pike and Highway 231 and Memorial Drive. I mean, is it, would it be worth, I don't know if it sets a precedent we don't want to mess with, I mean, would it be worth the idea of maybe saying, you know, for residential, maybe we try to do 25 bucks or something, give them, I mean, some kind of something for... The fact that there is some effort when we change, when you know, maybe a commercial would be 50 bucks because they got vendors and, and all that. I mean, the person that I talked to didn't ask me this. I just was thinking in my mind, it, it is, it's it's a bummer to get your dress changed. Um, but I don't know, something nominal. I know it's nominal. I don't want that to be a, I wouldn't want it to be more of a gut punch than, a, than something that's real. But, you know, heck, if you, I mean, Sometimes a twenty-five or fifty-dollar gift certificate, or a, you know something like that, is a nice. At least, hey, we acknowledge it's it's a bummer. We're doing it for the right reasons. I mean, I thought the guy. I mean, look, this it was a layup that we changed the guys out there. I mean, you know, it had to be done, and he understood all that. I don't know. It kind of felt like I almost wanted to be able to say, you know, here's a little something for from the city for the for the trouble. Something maybe we'll think about, and it would be, you know. With this one, it's a lot. You know, it's a lot more. That was only what four, three, you know, three, I believe, four yeah. or five addresses or six. I mean, this is four hundred. So I mean, if we did something like that, we'd be, you know, this would Ten be a biggie thousand. if we did it. 
Um, but anyway, something maybe we think about over the next week or so. We don't have to take it up right now, but I just, I don't know, it just came to me and thought maybe it'd be nice if it was something we, if you guys thought maybe we'd pursue. So maybe just think about that to our next meeting or something, okay? Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. Sure. Thank you, Matthew. All right, we'll now move into a discussion on impact fees. Yeah, Mayor, we uh, <clears throat> talked about this, oh man, a few months ago now, I can't remember exactly when. Uh, and so uh, we have uh, brought back our uh, cons consultant, Carson Weiss, to, to lead us through a uh, continuation of that discussion and to answer some of the questions that came up at that point in time. So I will turn it over to Carson, who's more than capable of taking you through all the, the details that you need. Okay, thank you, Craig. Um, first of all, good afternoon, Mayor, members of Council. Um, I believe we took this up in the first week of November, uh, is what my recollection was, I think. It was either that or late October. Uh, and so if you recall, you asked us to come back to you um, with, uh, we talked about an option. Uh, if you recall the last go round where, if you remember, the fees were done on a per unit basis. So the fees, the draft fees you saw last time were by single family unit versus multifamily unit. And we talked about an option where we do it by size of unit. And so we're, we're coming back to you uh, with, with this option as well as uh, the other piece of information you requested was a comparison of the proposed fees in Murfreesboro to uh, other surrounding cities in the region. So we, we have that for you as well. Um, I'll just, just to reintroduce ourselves, our firm uh, specializes in impact fees and, and fiscal analysis. We've done more of this than anybody in the country and, and uh, we're, we're based in, in Bethesda, Maryland and Boise, Idaho. Uh, so sort of a little refresher here. You know, impact fees are a one-time uh, calculation of growth-related infrastructure. It's usually collected at the time of building permit, and that's specified in the ordinance that you would have that adopt, adopts the fees. If you recall from our last discussion, we can't use the impact fees for, for operations, maintenance. Uh, we also can't correct existing deficiencies. Uh, with impact fees, and what I mean by that is, you know, oftentimes a parks and recreation master plan uh, may have an adopted level of service of, let's say, 10 acres per thousand residents, but if we're currently only providing parks at a rate of seven and a half acres per thousand, we have to base the impact fee on our actual level of service versus our, our goal or adopted level of service. It's also important uh, to, to remember that this is not a tax. Um, and I bring this up because, uh, you know, many jurisdictions we work in, we, we hear particularly the, the home builders community or the Chamber of Commerce, for instance, refer to this as a tax on new development. And I'm sure you're aware a tax is, is primarily a revenue raising mechanism and a fee, much like, you know, when you calculate a fee for the cost of, of doing plan review, that fee is generally has to be no more than the cost of the, the service you're providing. And with impact fees, it goes a step further. We have to uh, meet three prongs of a legal test. First, we have to document or, or show nexus or need. So through the impact fee study, we're, we're showing that the city has grown, that growth has necessitated the need for, for parks and recreation and transportation infrastructure. That growth is going to continue into the future. And that growth, if you will demand, uh, if you want to maintain current levels of service, additional infrastructure. So that's how we show need. Uh, we also have to show benefit, and you show benefit two ways. One is through the timing of the expenditure, meaning that the city just can't collect impact fees and, and, and you know not spend them for 10 or 12 or 15 years. We have to spend the money in a timely fashion. And the other way we show benefit is through uh, doing an evaluation to see if we need to establish uh, benefit areas. Now, in a community the size of Murfreesboro, we typically don't have to get into that. Uh, so we are recommending citywide fee structures. And then finally, we have to show proportionality. And that, that's really the key to the discussion that we're going to have today. Uh, you know, when we, we show proportionality by calculating the fees by different type of land use. That's why we showed, you know, single family versus multifamily. For transportation, the fee varies between retail and office and industrial. So, so that's how we show proportionality. I'll skip the, the boring method part here. Uh, 
the, one of the things we do have to calculate within the fees is the need for credits. And if you remember from our previous discussion, uh, credits refer to uh, the principle of we, we don't want new development to pay twice, once through the impact fee and then again through a potential uh, other stream of revenue, whether it's property tax or sales tax or debt service payments, et cetera. Um, and then obviously through the implementing ordinance itself, we have to have a provision in there for site-specific credits. And what we mean by that is, is if the city were to implement, uh, let's say, a parks and recreation impact fee, and a developer, as part of their project, gives the city, let's say, a 100-acre parcel, well, the impact fee is also paying for their fair share of new parks facilities. So we have to credit that 100-acre parcel back to the developer off the, the impact fee calculation through a development agreement. Now, uh, I'll summarize the 10-year growth projections being used in the study. Uh, we are projecting an increase of about 48,000 persons, uh, 14, almost 15,000 15, single-family units, an increase of about uh, almost 5,000 single, or excuse me, multifamily units. From a non-residential perspective, we're projecting an increase of uh, about 6,650 jobs and about 3.9 million square feet of additional um, non-residential floor area over the next 10 years. Now this shows the type of analysis we had to do uh, to make the relationship between house size and the number of people. Uh, we used uh, data derived from the American Community Survey public use microsample data uh, for the area that includes Murfreesboro. And we also use the size data from the, the, the Census Bureau for the East South Central region. So. What we're able to do is, is get a linear regression analysis, and you see that under this proposed fee approach, we don't have a multifamily category, and we wouldn't have a single family category. It would just be size of unit. So by default, you would assume you know apartment is going to be captured in that 800 or less, or the 800 square feet to 1,000 square feet, and the larger units would be captured in that third tier, which is 1,000 to, to 1,200 square feet. But you can see that there's a relationship up to a certain point, it ends right around 4,000 square feet, where you do have an increase in the number of people as the size of the unit goes up, and then it levels off. Okay, And that leveling off point is something that, that varies greatly from community to community uh, throughout our work in the United States. But you can see here the smaller units, uh, which would include you know, one bedroom and, and studio units, generate almost less than a person, uh, and then all the way up to 3.46 uh, is the highest uh, person per household size. We do the same thing with vehicle trips. So we can calculate uh, customized vehicle trip rates for each community using the ITE or Institute, Institute of Transportation Engineers formula. And so if we know the number of people per unit and the number of vehicles available per unit, we can calculate these trip rates. And so you can see here that the trip rates range from almost three for the smallest unit uh, to almost 11 and a half for the largest unit. And by comparison, the national average for an average single family house is 9.52. So you can see here the larger units are generating above that, that amount, and then the lower, or excuse me, the smaller units are generating a lesser uh, trip rate. So turning our attention to parks and recreation, uh, if you remember from our last discussion, those components included park land, uh, the, the improvements to those parks or the amenities, uh, community centers, as well as the five-year cost of actually doing the impact fee study. Uh, we took a consumption-based approach where that's essentially a snapshot of your current level of service in terms of park acres per, per person, amenities per person, et cetera. And all the costs are allocated to residential development, uh, which is fairly standard in a community uh, with the demographics of Murfreesboro. You're not building parks in reaction to office and retail development. You're building parks in uh, reaction to uh, uh, the number of people moving into the, to the area. So 
if you remember from our last meeting, what we did is we took the level of service standards, which are shown in the top part of the table, uh, and we applied those to the 10-year projection of population, which is shown in the second part of the table. And so by applying those standards, we get a projection of demand. So over the next 10 years, uh, we, uh, if, if the growth projection holds, new development would demand 70 million or almost 70 million uh, dollars worth of parks and recreation expenditures. Well, the city could decide to spend 120 million over that time frame. It's just that new development's share of that would be the almost 70 million, because again, we can't we can't use the impact fees to correct uh, existing deficiencies. Now, the, the 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 nice part of this approach is that. Uh, you're only obligated to build to the standard or to the amount you collected. So what that means is if there's an unforeseen recession over the next 10 years and the growth forecast is half of this and it only generates the need for $35 million uh, worth of parkland, that's all the city has to spend. You don't have to spend the 70 like if we'd have done a plan-based approach. So this approach is it sort of insulates you from uh, market conditions that may fluctuate over a 10-year period. So this was the option you saw at our last meeting where we take those, those different cost components to get a, a cost per person and then we compare those to the, the citywide averages by single family versus multifamily to get the draft fees of $38.81 for a single family unit and $2,857 for a multifamily unit. Now when we do the second option, seriously, that should say option two, not option one, um, that same, the cost per person is the same, but when we compare it to the persons per housing unit, uh, the fees range from 1270 per unit uh, up to uh, uh, 4992 for the largest size. And the, so you can see that the average unit is somewhere between uh, the 2,500 and, and 3,000 square feet because if you remember from the previous slide, the, the, uh, the fee was 38.81, so it falls in between the 37.22 and 41.12 uh, uh, size categories there. And we did the same thing with streets, and if you remember from our last discussion, the components there are arterial road capacity, bike lanes, and the cost of the impact fee study. We did the same thing. We took a consumption-based approach, and the costs were allocated to residential and non-residential development using a standard known as vehicle miles of travel, which uh, multiplies the trips per land use by the average trip length on the network to get vehicle miles of travel. And this shows uh, the existing VMT uh, within the network, uh, and that's within the urban growth boundary. Uh, and this map here is from the 2040 plan, uh, and the majority of art arterials within the city operate at a level of service D or below, which is pretty standard. Also, for most of the communities we work with uh, of this size, and the consumption-based approach we were using ensures that uh, the future street needs will not increase the LOS, or meaning that we're not correcting any existing deficiencies through the methodology. This summarizes our, our, our vehicle miles of travel factors from the analysis. And then the cost per lay mile assumptions uh, were based on an analysis of the CIP where we looked at uh, the state and federal sources that come into uh, the city CIP versus uh, what your share would be. And so the net city cost is estimated to be slightly over a million dollars, uh, whereas the, the gross uh, cost per lane mile is, is slightly over two million dollars. So essentially, we've we've necessi we've we've eliminated the need for a credit within the methodology because we've credited uh, it off the top, so to speak, to get the net cost. This is a very uh, confusing table, I'm sure. Uh, but basically, if you look at the top of it, it shows what the average trip length is on the network, which is slightly over four miles, and the vehicle capacity per lane assumption for the level of service D. And so what we, what we did here is we built an aggregate demand model. And what you want to pay attention to is, 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 the, is the area in green there, which says VMT, and it says annual increase in lane miles. And on the far side, over the 10 years, we show that under the existing level of service and this growth projection, growth would generate the need for, for slight or almost 59 uh, additional lane miles uh, at a total cost of about $64.4 <clears throat> million. And this shows option one, which the, the street impact fees 
uh, under the, the, the one size fits all sort of single family versus multifamily approach, uh, where the fees are $2,395 compared to $1,857 for multifamily units. And then when we look at non residential development, as you would expect, uh, commercial development generates substantially more trips in office and industrial. Uh, so it has the highest fee per thousand square feet at about $3,321. That's followed by institutional office and then industrial flex has the lowest uh, transportation fee per thousand square feet. Now when we look at option two, the non-residential fees remain unchanged, uh, but the fees for uh, residential development vary from 690 uh, dollars per square foot to $2,879 per square foot under this approach. And so uh, when we look at the draft fees under the option one, uh, the full freight, if you will, for single family unit is, is $6,276 compared to $4,714 for multifamily unit. Uh, there is no fee for parks, so the non-residential non fees are just what we just uh, discussed for streets. And then when we look at option two, uh, the full freight ranges for, for residential units, uh, a low of 1960 to a high of 7871. And then finally, uh, we, you ask us, well, what is, how do our proposed fees stack up to some other jurisdictions in the region? Uh, and you know, I, I tend not to like these comparisons, and I, but I know why uh, folks want to see it. But it's really not an apples to apples uh, comparison because uh, there are several factors that go into this. One is, as you can see, there are certain fees that some communities have elected not to charge for whatever reason. Uh, another factor is you don't know exactly what year these fees were done. So some of these fees may have been updated in the last two years, while others may be 10 or 15 years old. Uh, another factor to consider is we don't know if certain jurisdictions adopt, adopted 100% of the proposed amount. So it, it's, it's, you know, there, there are a lot of caveats to this, but under the current fee structures, um, Franklin and Nolansville are at the highest at over 10,000 apiece, and Franklin's almost 13,000. Uh, you would fall uh, the third highest, but again, the delta above third place and second place is quite high. It's, it's, it's over $4,000 a house. Uh, and then Spring Hill, White House, and Portland have uh, the lowest fee structures. So that gives you a, a flavor for if you were to implement these at 100% of the maximum rates where you would uh, rank, rank within the, the hierarchy in the region. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Is there a way to get a copy of this PowerPoint? Sure. Yeah. Could you back up just a couple of slides to, yeah, maybe one more. So actually go forward one for me now, I think. Forward one? Yeah, right there. So, like, when there's a difference, let's just talk about the so the streets column, for example. Okay, so you've got single family at twenty three ninety five, the multi family at eighteen fifty seven. Now go forward for me again. Does it? Is there a? I'm sorry, I may have just missed some of this, but as far as when you look at a square footage view of this, it doesn't differentiate in any way between single family and multi family. Is that? Am I understanding that correctly? That's correct. Okay. Did, did I understand correctly, too, that when we talked about this the first time around, that we don't get to pick and choose, for example, hey, we want to reduce the parks and rec by X amount, we want to hold the streets by keep it at 100%. We, we don't have that ability based on the study that you did. No, you, you have the ability to, you could adopt, let's say, 100% of the transportation fee and 50% of the, the parks fee. What we, I think what you're referring to is we discussed we can't, we can't, uh, um, discriminate against certain land uses. So we couldn't say we're going to adopt 100% of the roads fee for non-residential development, but only 50% for single family because we have to treat everybody equally. But you, you can't adopt lesser amounts. You just with the understanding that you're going to have to come up with the money from another source. Sure. Yeah. And how did the... Um when we left, I think one of the things we talked about is we were going to have stakeholder meetings and you were going to conduct those. Are you going to talk about that, give us some feedback there? Uh, we haven't had any stakeholder meetings. I think that's maybe one of the actions that may come out of today's discussion. But we're prepared to do that, certainly. Hey, I want to, no, sir, I was just going to disclose, I'm, I'm going to, 
abstain from any discussion on the impact fee um, in, impact fee discussion just for the line of work I'm in even though you know you try not to be you try to be objective I, I think it'd be better off just I'll sit here and be quiet so make sure I'm like from I was going to ask this question that was similar to Ronnie with maybe a, a little more detail but from a from a process standpoint can we kind of go over that again I mean what happens from here I guess you know the stakeholder meetings and what does that look like and then to clarify a little bit on the how do we technically adopt this and I think I hear what you're saying because you know if we based on your study is it true to say based on your study we could say or let me just ask you this would we say okay we are going to agree to do um, to do these both parks and streets, but then we have to have a separate um, motion or whatever it would be to say what percentage are we going to adopt of each of those, or do we? Is that just all one thing? I believe it's all one thing. I mean, the process going forward would be you would give us direction, and I assume that direction would be. You know, we want to hear from the stakeholders, and typically, what a jurisdiction would do is, is they wouldn't decide today that they want to go the size versus the one size fits all. They typically would get feedback from the stakeholders. You know, some places, like for instance, just about every fee study we do in Colorado, the home builders love the size by or the fees by size of house. Not a single one of our Arizona clients have adopted that. The home builders hate it there. So you never know what you're going to find, right? Uh, so normally we have one or two meetings with stakeholders. Then we would come back through the adoption process where uh, you would have to have an ordinance written that you know, sets forth the policies and procedures for refunds, appeals, et cetera. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I, mean, I haven't... You caught me off guard. I don't have the private act in front of me in terms of um, what it says for the adoption process. But you would advertise it like a public hearing. And then as part of the motion or the resolution that you pass would be the fee amount. Okay. Right? And so it would already be baked into that motion whether you were adopting 100% or 75% or, or whatever. Yeah, it could, it could be done either way. Okay. Uh, you could make it one whole motion if everybody wanted to, to vote on that. But if there was a discussion, it looked like there was a some discussion that they wanted to vary the fees, and you'd probably do it too because you know you're going to get something, you just don't know what it is. Yeah, that's so we I can guess handle that's, it either way. That's kind of what I was asking is that, you know, we've done the study yeah. now, we've kind of gone through this thing, get the nexus work, all that kind of stuff done. That if we said, well, we want to, I, I didn't know if there was some separate way to say, well, we will adopt the study basically so that now we know what the numbers would be but that would just open the door for us later or a future council to come in and say <clears throat> yeah well okay now we want to pick up and adopt 25 percent of the parks piece and 50 percent of the streets piece or whatever I, that that was the part that i kind of wasn't real sure of i, I don't want you know even if we decide to not charge it a single dollar on impact fees does it make sense to adopt the study so that then we don't have to go through the study well two or three or four years from now does it i would think still i'll let adam weigh in but from a, the standpoint of establishing a legal nexus for the amount that you put in you probably need to go through the study right. if it's any amount of time I mean, if it's a few months from now big deal if it's three years from now yeah, things might change enough okay. here that you have to do the study. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm would, just thinking out loud yeah. just about what some possibilities sure. might look like on this going forward. So I'm just so trying to. We don't want to adopt the study before we do a public. No, no, no. I, okay. All right. Not me. So, I, mean, so I got a two part uh, sure. question. So, what what is the potential consequences, for example, uh, when we're talking uh, economic development impact? Um, well, I mean, you're just going to hear my opinion. <laughs> okay. Um, we, you know, We've been in business over 40 years. We've got 70 impact fee jobs going right now across the country. So obviously, impact fees haven't retarded development in those jurisdictions. We have no empirical, we've seen no empirical data where anybody has ever implemented an impact fee system and growth has dried up or gone away or slowed down because there is a reason folks and businesses want to locate in a community, whether it's transportation advantages, quality of life, um, you know, all sorts of different factors that go into, into these locational decisions. And because it now costs 
$6,000 more for the point of entry into the city of Murfreesboro, in my opinion, it's not going to drive away development. And the other thing you have to keep in mind is that, you know, and, and I don't, I don't mean to, 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 to be, uh, you know, cavalier in this, in this statement, but uh, you also have to remember that you're wrapping this fee up into a mortgage, right? And so I'll give you an example. So in, in the state of South Carolina, the act says you have to do uh, do an analysis of the impact of, of the fees on housing affordability. So, in short, what you do is you figure out based on census data what the you know, average price of a house is, the average incomes, and you figure out you look at the average utility bills in the area, and you figure out you know because sort of the standard loan is you know 33 percent of your income or no more than 33 percent of your income should be spent on housing. So we figure out what that percentage is on average in the community before the impact fee. And we're talking about an $18,000 school impact fee. And once you, you know, baked it into the mortgage, assuming some down payment assumptions, interest rate, et cetera, it moved less than a percentage point in terms of what it meant to their monthly costs. So that's something that sort of gets lost in these discussions when you say, well, yeah, $6,000 or $7,000 is a significant amount of money to add on to the top of a house. But we also have to keep in mind what the real economics of that are over a 30-year period. Okay. Can we go back to the screen where you have all the CDs up there? Yeah. Oops, sorry. So for a single family, we're talking 6276 for Marfa's Mm-hmm. For me, I, I, I think that's, that's really high compared to you look at Franklin and Mount Juliet. I mean, that's just my opinion. I'm, I'm, I'm You're just... talking about Brentwood? Yeah. Well, Brentwood and let's compare Franklin, Brentwood, and Mount Juliet in there, too. Well, I think we'll have a chance to talk about all that after we get some stakeholder feedback, too. Oh, yeah. but, that's, but I just wanted to put that out there. One of the things that I might, uh, you know, say or ask in, in terms of when we go through our stakeholder meetings, I, you know, I've already heard comments like, and, and this kind of, this, uh, this is why I don't, you know, you've already said you kind of don't like these, these charts a little bit. You know, part of what I don't like is that I don't really understand, like, the, the real total cost and and sometimes you know you deal with this like in uh when we deal with people's salaries that work for the city it's not just the salary that matters you know it's the benefit package too you know that it's the total it's the total benefit right. and salary value that really kind of should matter so one of the things that i would ask maybe our staff as we're going forward with this is to to try to help us understand i mean i think those are good i think all of those are good comparisons i mean as far as if, we wanted to plug in a different city or whatever we could. What you know, anybody wants to plug some other city in, but you know, for example, do we have a water tap fee and they don't? Yeah. Or do we? You know, I mean, so I know I've already heard some of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to be less on this end, but we're more on the other end. So really, we're already paying more than Smyrna is, or you know, than we have to pay in Smyrna, even though we don't have an impact fee right now. I don't know what those details are, but I guess I just might ask our staff to make sure that. To try to provide that for us, some comparison that looks like this, that's more of a total, you know, a total total cost, not just the impact fee piece, but the, you know, the total cost of uh, permits and connections and all that. Does that make sense? Yeah. And to add one more piece to that, I think overlaying that with the median cost of housing stock in that area and the percentage of what fee we're tacking on to the median cost is really relative too because you know what's 12 what's thirteen thousand dollars in franklin in comparison to what six grand is in murfreesboro in comparison to what four grand is in smyrna with the average price of a household so i mean i think that's good information for us to have as decision makers as we're looking at it um yeah, look at it on a percentage basis. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just so you know, relative, <coughs> relative standpoint. Yeah. And then, Sam, how many um, residential permits did we do last year? Uh, Mr. Wade, we did about 2,000, just under 2,000. So I think that, that uh, $6,000 per residential unit that's up there, that's about 12 million a year. Based on last year's numbers, that's been pretty consistent range for us for about uh, five to six years. 
Okay. Thank you. Can I ask a question about sure. apartments? And I think I know the answer. I just want to clarify. Let's say somebody comes in and builds a uh, college house, like a quad living, where you've got four separate units plus a common area. Does that get assessed as total square footage of the four units and the common, or a per bit room situation? It would be the size of the house, the, the covered area of the house. So it would include the common area. Yeah. What about a, so, so I guess it leads me to the question, and I, I do want to follow up with that, as it relates to more than just a quad, but an actual apartment facility. <clears throat> Is it going to be a per unit? Per unit for an apartment building. And how do you delineate? Where, where does the line cross to to be from a townhome or or quad kind of a building to a a multifamily apartment? Where where does that? Well, apartments we apartments are built per unit, so you're going to come in with a building that may be per door. Per, you know, maybe sixty thousand square feet, minute? but it's going to have twenty four units. So you would get the average the size of each of those twenty four units where the quad example is a single family structure, right? That's just divided by into four separate living areas, right? No, no, it's an apart it's an apartment. Just oh, okay. So apartment. it's almost like a quadplex instead of a duplex. Well, no, it's an apartment that's got four individual rooms with full bathrooms and then it's got a common It's almost like a dorm. It's, it's right. almost like a dorm, right. So but private. Single, single occupancy room. You right. know, they yeah, that's room. yeah, we'd have to think about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but Probably we also are square feet. Yeah. discouraging yeah. those from being right. Covered. I'm just saying for just yeah. for so We have approved a, model, a, a residential model like that at some time. It yeah. probably won't. There are some out there though, yeah, so we'd have to figure out how to do that. And and the delineation on what it would be, I think, would depend on our zoning code and but how we would classify it to fit it into the but to, the impact. Thinking team. about townhomes too, just you know, as far as if. Is there some difference if there's seven doors under one roof versus if there's only two? The townhome would be per unit. Yeah. Yeah, because it's a single family attached unit. So, or so detached, excuse me, attached unit. To, but to your point, foot, um, no matter what, what fee category or approach <clears throat> you take, you're going to have. You're going to have an issue at some point where something doesn't fit into the, the square peg, and so I mean, we offer free of charge. I mean, all of our clients call us with, you know, a go kart facility <laughs> just came through the door. How do we how do we place a fee on this? Or yeah, you know, there's all these things come up. So we're, we're we'll be there to help you with it. So just looking at this to to maximize the effectiveness of it it would be best for the city to grow out and expand out instead of just redevelopment to maximize the number of doors and units that are going to be affected correctly. So if you keep the same surface area of the city and just do redevelopment, you're not going to have as much growth as if you expand out. So you're, if you expand out, you can go up with the numbers too, correct? Um, well, and this wasn't done with that in mind. Um, I understand yeah. it wasn't done with that in mind, but just thinking just there's a finite amount of land right now right so if you can only do so much redevelopment without just running out of land so at some point you would have to expand the bear the borders just for this to make sense correct I, i'm not sure I, I, don't, I, I agree with that um and by redevelopment are you are you assuming that uh units are torn down and like let's say a smaller unit is torn down and replaced with a bigger unit or, or we case, go vertical you, that, whatever the case may be as far as redevelopment i mean there's only so much land so once you use all that land you've either got to tear down and build new or something else right and that's some of the things that would have to be ironed out within the ordinance itself because you know one of the you know, there's pros and cons with each approach so for instance um with the one size fits all approach, if you tore down a, let's say a 1200 square foot bungalow and replaced it with a 6,000 square foot McMansion, there would be no fee because you've replaced one single family unit with another. What a lot of jurisdictions do when they do adopt the size approach is, is they allow you some sort of expansion you know, for instance, you may just want to build, make your house bigger. You know, you're going to add on to your kitchen, et cetera, et cetera. And why should the fact that you expanded your house 5,000, or excuse me, 500 square feet, mean that you've got to pay some impact fees? So most most places have, they'll allow you to expand it up to a certain percentage of the original footprint. 
then the fee tax you know, comes in after that. So, uh, so that's that's an issue with redevelopment. So to pick up on your redevelopment, if you tear down ten houses to build thirty houses, you're going to have ten of those thirty aren't going to have impact fees. Essentially, charged. yeah, so you pay them just, on the net. Yeah. Okay, that's what I was thinking. Some of it depends on how it's implemented too. And remember, you're covering part of or all of, or attempting to cover all of the fees in there. So on a redevelopment standpoint, in theory, would you build another park? Well, maybe not. You know, you wouldn't, so you wouldn't necessarily have to have the, the impact fee roadways. You may want to expand it, although a lot of times it's not possible anyway. So, you, so you know, expand, the expansion out model is really what you're trying to capture because now it's all new. New that's, parks, that's, new roads, new That's models. my point, that to really maximize the effectiveness of it, you almost have to expand out because of redevelopment at some point. In redevelop, it gets funny in redevelopment. I mean, you'll see communities, uh, and, and Phoenix is a good example, if you drive in some areas of Phoenix that are being redeveloped from very small houses to huge houses, you'll see there'll be one wall. They'll tear down everything but one wall. Mm -hmm. and you think, well, why, they, why in the world do they do that to avoid the development impact fee? Because now they're just remodeling. <laughs> yeah, so that was very common. I don't know if they corrected it in the five yeah. years I've been gone. But but, was all did that happen on... Uh, <laughs> good attorney. Where, that happened on, on Church Street. Remember the, the duplex that was being built back and the whole time the duplex was being built back there was an iron set of steps and a wall that they yeah. didn't... That's what you'd see. They didn't tear that down because if they tore that down it kicked a different code into place. Yeah. I do want to make sure I'm I'm kind of clear on something too. Just uh, I heard you say something that uh, maybe I just haven't really thought of it this way, but um, it sounds like if we adopt an impact fee um, for streets, for example, that the projections that you gave us for the costs that it would be, you know, the extra $69 million or whatever that's going to cost to build a 59 million, 59 miles, sorry. We're committed to that unless the projections are off. So if 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 you're did I did I hear that right? Right, there? but the money's going to be there to cover it, where now it isn't, and you're just having to come up with that money. Well, we don't build the road. Right, right, and the I mean, level of service continues to deteriorate. I guess what yeah. I'm saying is, right now there's still the option that we don't build the road. Right. I, I don't I don't right. like that option, but it it's it clearly happened from time to time. But I mean. My point is, I guess I'm just trying to ask, we're committed. As long as your projections, you know, there's 48,000 new whatever's come in the next however many years, that we better have spent X amount of dollars on lane miles mm -hmm. in that time period. Is that that's, yep. that's correct? Yep. If we charge the fee, collect the revenue, we've got to spend it on the road. Yeah, I mean, I, but, and, but I want to go. I, I, well, I was, was going to say to Sean's, right. you know, to we Sean's point, that. I'm trying to figure out you know, to make sure there is, I mean, you know, is are we capable of building out 59 lane miles within what we have right now, unless there's some annexation. Money, he'll build right. Well, is that, does that, well, I mean, this may feel like, it's, this feels a little bit like a stupid question, because I think I know the answer, but a lane mile would include adding a lane to an existing road? Yes, yes, yeah. yes, okay. yes, and to count some, make sure. And yeah. is it, you're at an angle. Is it right? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, but to your point, I mean, you, you raised several good points. Uh, but the the model. That, for, first of all, a lot of people forget that impact fees are actually a land use regulation. It's, just, it's not just a revenue source. And so there are ways in the land use, or you can craft the impact fee to incentivize or encourage certain behavior. But the model that we did this under assumes that you're still in that sort of traditional suburban model. Now, if something were to drastically change and the focus were on nothing but redevelopment, you, would, you wouldn't take the approach we did because we're still building urban or suburban parks and building suburban style arterial capacity where if, if something changes, like in Missoula, Montana, you know, 15 years ago, we, they were trying to encourage that redevelopment, and so the fee structure we did was very different, and it incentivized development downtown. But they've been so successful now with the development downtown that the fee is so high now downtown because that's where they're building all their mobility improvements as, as a result of their success. But again, it, it, we would take a very urban model versus a suburban model under that that context. So what about 
fees that we already have now for street in lieu of construction and other projects, how does that yeah, so we, correlate? We have, you'd have to take a look at that within the ordinance to make sure that there's no double dipping. But typically what you see is there are, you know, the, the fees are covering what we call system level improvements, right? And usually what, what I think you're referring to are the project level improvements where, you know, developer has to build a turn lane into their project or, you know, they're dedicating, you know, five acres of parkland for a tot lot, which is just for that development. Uh, whereas the fees are going for the system-wide things that they're, they're demanding throughout the, the, the city. Is there anything materially different different about this information than what we presented in November? It's just the, the fee structure. So part of what I'm confused about, why are we just now looking at this in March? Uh, probably not your question, but maybe your question. If we are going to do uh, surveys with the community in January and February, and we didn't do that, and now we're talking about doing that now, we're going to be months away from another decision before we actually do something. What did we do during that period of time, if nothing's materially changed? I mean, nothing's material changed in the data that we have? Yes. I just want to make sure I'm not missing something, because this looks like a repeat of what we did in November. No, it's more information. I mean, we answered the questions we had before. To some extent, it is. I mean, to review and get everybody updated. But you know, there's more information. The fee comparison is one we was asked about that, and then we differentiated with square footage. I think was the other thing that we added in in there. Um, so, and then the you know, from a timing standpoint, is when it fit in our schedule of. I'm just thinking we're getting ready to go into budget, so we got a lot of stuff going on. I don't want this to go to December of next year before we do something, before we get to a point, because we've been dragging. I feel like we've been dragging feet on this. Well, and we, we've done the studies. We can fit it in um, during the a budget year. I mean, we're not, we wouldn't budget for next year using these numbers right now anyway. That's, that wouldn't be aware of how we prepare a budget. Even if we'd done it in January, it would take us several months to get it in, and then we would probably have a period of time before it would be effective because we're not, you know, we have to grandfather in some things, you know, maybe not housing and permits and fees, but some some situations. So I don't think this year we would have put it in our budget necessarily. And if we worked it in and we put it in the budget, we can accommodate that by making adjustments to our budget. So looking forward, let's let's. Let's drill down on that process a little bit so we know how to kind of think about what our timeline does look like for getting those meetings set. What do you see typically is a number of stakeholder meetings and, you know, obviously, well, let me see, what do you see as typical that uh, that a city would, our size would do for something like usually, that? You usually have two, two stakeholder meetings. Sometimes, sometimes they, you know, something comes up and there's a third or a fourth, but yeah. usually it's two. And are they typically a month apart to give people to kind of think through? Yeah, because something may come out or? of the first that requires us to do some some homework or you know, rejiggering of some numbers or maybe something we haven't thought of that someone brings up. You know, it, I mean, so, uh, yeah, so usually, yeah, four weeks. Yeah. 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 One other question. This is probably staff related too. So um, we talk a lot about the expense of schools. Um, Talk about why we didn't include schools in this study. Um, we had talked, I mean, the general discussion about schools, and we've covered schools. We could include schools, we could add schools in. Um, but the question I think that needs counsel from a policy standpoint that they need to talk about is whether we are going to finance another school going forward. Um, and I think that's a big question on there, and so we didn't we didn't want to spend the expense and time on that until we covered off that issue. And there's not another school planned. Uh, we have one in uh, our CIP, but it's off several years. Yeah, it's way beyond future. Yeah, it's beyond future now. So um, you know, if we were to implement impact fees in the next year or so, it wouldn't include a school in there because we wouldn't have built a school. Um, and, and we're not talking about expanding any schools that we have now. So that's why we excluded schools from this one. We felt like parks and, uh, and streets were the, the needs that we face now, and we wanted to focus on that. And then if we need to build on that, we can build on that. Just 
thinking that it might have been beneficial to have that information in concert as having with having the discussions on schools. Well, we would have we would have been estimating the cost of a new school off several years, and so we, we could have done that, and we would have been a very speculative number. Um, yeah, we can still do it if we want. I mean, you know. Yeah, we can add it. Right? We can we add can it always in. add it if everybody wants to. I, you know, I think getting a start on this. I did have a question on the. I actually kind of had the same question. Did we look at the original? And I apologize for not going back and looking at this, but on the meeting that we have in November, was it? Did we talk about a police number in that one at all? We just started with straight up parks and streets. That's right. Didn't look at anything else at that time either, right? Okay. I was just kind of thinking, I know that fire and police is also something I always hear about the number of people. You know, we always, our our ratio that we use is always gauged on the number of people that we have, you know, as far as how many officers per per person, you know, per citizen, whatever the right word would be for that. But And you can see time. that a lot of the other community, there's some other communities that do it, but most of them yeah. don't, yeah. don't do an impact fee for that. Yeah. So what are, what are we what do we what do you need from, what are we saying you need from us? Well, I think from a staff level, what we'd like to do is if if there is uh, a majority of council would like to move forward, uh, we can put together stakeholder meetings and, and continue the work. Um, the question would be is it is it something that council wants to continue to consider many impact fees, and if so, we'll get a community we'll get the community meetings together. Uh, of course, if not, then. And we'll move on and table this for now, and then in the future, if it comes back up, we'll have a good running start at doing some of this. So announce. the numbers that we looked at are really just something up on the wall to look at and to look at how, I mean, these could change when we get to a final draft as to what we're going to do. You're going to reevaluate that, or are these two options what we are going to consider? Well, I mean, I think that um, in terms of the the maximum amounts that those aren't likely to change much, if if at all. It's more of uh, what's the what's the feedback you get from the stakeholders, and what is the and if you feel comfortable going forward, at what amounts do you feel comfortable going forward with? Yeah, I think the important word, if I'm not mistaken, and I, 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 I'm learning on this, but is you use the term maximum amount. That that number right there is the maximum amount. So that we can justify. When we're comparing, I think for what you said. CIP, we're talking about no, for for the study. For the study. The maximum amount that we could charge right. for these two things is sixty two seventy six, right? That's the yeah. but we could adopt a fifty percent on both of those and the total impact to the home buyer, developer, resident you know, commercial building is 3100 instead of 6200 So you've come back with a study that said, hey, guys, this is the maximum amount you can do on these different areas. We can adopt whatever percentage of that we want to. Right. Is that correct? That's correct. I'm good with yeah, whichever the ones that we're talking We've talked about Parks and Recreation Street. I mean, you, you can choose one or the other or both. Yeah. Yeah, and a percentage of it. So this is not a discussion on whether I'm for or against the fee, but one thing we need to talk about, you know, in the Blackman area, we just built, because of growth in that area, we just paid, what was it, four? What was the total cost we had for the fire truck, the station out there? Oh, the new station, yeah, it was about four million. Four point four. Four point four. And so we spent four point four out there, not including. 24 new firefighters to be able to be able to man that fire station. The pump truck that we had to bought, we had to buy. I think you could have an argument that as areas grow, our I think we're one police officer per 2,000 residents. Isn't that what we try to keep the ratio at? I'd have to ask Mike. Yeah, that's, that's, anyway, I think there is an argument that you could look at. Every year we're buying a new fire truck. We're we're adding on to. Equipment, right? You know, so I think there is an argument. You could say that growth does cause extra expenditures in police and fire. That you know you're going to have that every single year, as opposed to trying to get money out the door to build a street or saving for a you know a forty million dollar park that may take you a while to do that. So that is a 
discussion when you're talking to residents that I do think there's there's a I'll ask the question this way, <laughs> and this may be I mean I I don't want to prolong the process here, but you asked the other question too that would go along with this. Sure. I mean how much how much trouble is it for us to see the school's number, the fire number, the the police number? I mean while we're at it, let's look at it all. I mean let's look at it all. Maybe I mean I I. I I'm okay with looking at all of it. I mean, obviously, that's going to be a bigger sticker shock factor, you know, if, some, if that number comes back to be 10,000 than if it goes back now, to be six. I, but. I, I can tell you now, based on national averages, the police fee is going to be somewhere probably between four and $600, and the fire EMS, you guys do EMS, right, in addition to fire? No, we're, it's we're just in. fire. Uh, probably <laughs> 700 bucks and you don't know what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you're wondering why everybody looks around a bit, kind of <laughs> well it makes a difference if you do both but you're i mean you're not you're talking probably less than 1500 bucks additional to the, the total fee schools, schools will be for police and fire schools is the unknown yeah. as you know you know we did williamson county school impact fee and you know it's 12 or thirteen thousand dollars so so that might be helpful in that's the discussion that he obviously. just yeah. asked <clears throat> that you just asked us it might be helpful for us to kind of see well what does that real cost look like we've looked like we've looked at it in terms of what it does to our property tax rate right because that's the only thing we have to look the only way we have to look at it right now um i don't know so so the question is how with the data that you already have collected, is there a whole lot, a whole separate set of data you got? I mean, you obviously got to look at. It's basically like three this. new, three new studies. So we haven't, we haven't even had discussions with police or fire. We haven't had any discussions with schools. So you have to do all of that. We have to calculate pupil generation rates for the school district. Um, yeah, I mean, schools are a lot of work. Um, the fire and police, the marginal cost of adding that because we've already done the. The development projections and stuff like that isn't that much. Mm -hmm. To and I think I mentioned this, and the rest of the council may not feel this way. Um, I, I struggle with that parks and rec fee. That's a big number, um, and that may sound like I want to cut all the trees down. That's not what I'm saying, but that's a, that's a big number. And so, um, you know, I, I would be comfortable adopting the street um, impact fee today. Um, the, the revenue to go to support um, the infrastructure improvements to our roads. I would really struggle with that parks fee. I don't know how to back off that. I don't even know how to justify where it falls in that range because I know that's really challenging. I understand how we got there based on per acre per person, and, and I get that. But that just feels really high to me. But in concert, if we're talking about schools, that parks fee may sound like it's a fraction of the school fee if we do that. So there's probably this bigger number we're looking at that's beyond just the street number. Um, I, I would probably, and I'm also struggling with waiting, right? So we've been working on this for a year. I don't want to wait another year you know, before we do something because I think we probably should have done this a little sooner than we already have done this. So I would probably lean in the direction of, if possible, Let's do some percentage of the street fee and gather some more information about fire, police, schools. Um, not that I have the ability to change that park number, but I'd like to change that park number. I know we're not, we probably can't do that. Um, well, no, so you, you, we, you, we could adopt. You enough, can. Well, right. the other thing, the other thing you can do, and this is my preference to, I, 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 I always feel you're better John, you're kind uh, of bigger organically dollars. reducing the fee <laughs> versus <laughs> just saying, we're going to reduce it by 50%, right? You're much more, you're better off because if, if, if you reduce it organically, you don't have to make up the difference because you're you basing the fee on another level of service. So what we've had clients do is you go through, you know, we, we're, we, we're at a high level. We, we could do another work session where we go Thanks into the nitty service. gritty and we've had clients say, you know what? We've got these four parks that are 500 acres a piece uh, that are increasing, artificially increasing our level of service, and we're not likely to do parks like this anymore in the future. So you excise those out from the level of service, and so you're basically doing it on the 30-acre parks. You may make a decision, you know, we're not likely to build another rec center, so you take that out. So there's other ways to do it other than just saying 50%. Yeah. 
And, I, and I'm not saying adopt, you know, if we have the ability to make an adjustment to even the streets fee, I'm not saying adopt the streets fee at 100%. If we know we've got something else coming, it might not be wise to take all of that, not knowing what we're getting ourselves into, if we're looking at schools, if we're looking at police and fire. But um, I just think, I think I know for what little bit of information I have, that that's something we need to do, and I'd be willing to do something there while we wait on other things, if that's possible. So the next step is stakeholder. I mean, do we do we do we do a public? Do you have to do a public hearing on this? Okay. Can I ask a question too? So, so from a from a stakeholder perspective, I think we. Would it be better to try to introduce all of this if we if we're going to take a look at the schools and police and fire numbers? Which I, you know, would it be easier and better, even though it will prolong because we'll have to get them the data? But um, you know, maybe at this point we don't necessarily need a separate workshop uh, shop on what the data is before we do the the public stuff because we kind of understand it a little bit better. I mean, I'll tell you, this stuff is substantially more. Um, there's substantially more to this than I ever thought about. I mean, just honestly, I mean, I thought impact fee, you charge it, you get it over with, it's over, you know. But there's a lot more to it than I ever would have expected. And there's a lot more probably thought I need to put into a lot of these things as it relates to how that, you know, how it makes our budget decisions going forward and all that kind of stuff. But, um, I mean, look, I'd be in favor of at least, at the very least, drumming up a quote for us to see what what that number might look like for us to go take a look at the police and the fire and the schools numbers and then we make a decision if that's something we want you to do the study and come back and just tell us what those maximum numbers look like at least we've got all five of those lines that we can put out in front of the public and say this is what we're working on i mean i don't know if there's bad parts of that i'm just talking out loud and brainstorming here is there i mean Again, we don't have to adopt any of it. Right. So, what I kind of. I, I think what you're saying makes sense to see the total package, but I, I can tell you, if you see the total package, it's like a wish list, and then we're going to make the difficult decision to say, pull this out, pull this out, and pull this out. And I, I think what Ronnie had said, uh, if there's a way. And I don't know. I mean, because you say, what are we going to charge them? I mean, the pressing need is roads. I think we all realize and we all agree that the public would agree that the street improvements, what we, you know, it's going to be pretty pretty easy to get that through to, to agree upon a, a, the street improvements. Uh, the other issues are going to be relative. And some of the decisions, whether we're going to continue to fund growth in, in schools, it, it, we've got to have that discussion. We as council have to have to make that decision. That's the first step is decide whether we're going to do that or not. Well, I guess I guess what I'm thinking, and I don't mean to cut you up, but I want I do want to address that just because in my mind, so we can kind of think through this. While we're having that discussion, it probably would be helpful to know. Well, hey, look, there's here's one direction we could go. We could keep it like it is and what we know we got to do is we got to tack on another 6,000 or 7,000 or 8,000 to or 13,000 12,000 whatever the number is to get to plug to our impact fees in order to pay for it if the if you know, average you got the knowledge at that point is what I'm kind of thinking it doesn't mean I understand what you're saying I, if average for police and fire is what a total of a thousand bucks or something, I would like to see the study on that because that seems like that was that'd be an easy decision to tack on that extra thousand to take care of fire and police on top of these two. The school number, depending on how astronomical it is, it may not be as easy of a decision to make that call. But schools are probably more, just like Ronnie said, I'm not going out to try to cut down all the trees or anything. But the schools is probably a more important thing than the parks. It's a, it's a it's a bigger wild card for us to get factors to Carson to do because we don't know. I mean, if we if we operate like we have in the past, and when we build schools for every X amount of students, if we're going to continue on that line, then we can get that data and give it. To, that's easy. If there's a notion that we're not going to do that anymore after building a thirty-six million dollar school, um, because we have an alternative, the county can build schools and let, let the county school system grow instead of ours. Um, then, or if we are going to build a school only when we get to a certain point, 
Those are kind of decisions we don't have. So we can get the number based on the past. It's going to be a lot larger than some of the really substantial decisions from a policy standpoint that council is going to make realistically going forward. You know, if we're not going to build another school, then, you know, the number changes a whole lot. Well, I think, you know, look, the reason I'm bringing it up the way I'm bringing it up is because clearly, you know, we're having a tax increase a year or two ago, you know, we kind of found out on the back end, right? Hey, there's a cost to these things that we're doing, and we got through all of that, and then we had to make a decision on the tax rate as far as what that total number has got us to, right? I mean, at least this point, we kind of can put some of that on the front end of the table and say, this is what it costs to make it happen. I would kind of know. That's just, so I, I'm not arguing with it. I'll do whatever y'all want. I'm good. So with how just long would it take you to do the uh, data on the school? Oh, if we, I mean, it's probably six weeks, seven weeks for us to do schools, police, fire. When, when would we have scheduled a, you know, a public hearing anyway, probably after tax time, so end of April? I mean, what do y'all? Uh, so you could bring, theoretically, you could bring it back to us for our May workshop to see police, fire, and schools, and then start the, public, the stakeholder meetings or something in June. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I will say, make a comment too, y'all. I mean, you know, part of this, the delay, you know, we've had stuff on our workshops, and, and maybe, you know, we're, we're, yeah, we're going to have something already probably scheduled for May, frankly, but I think the next, the next, approach of this probably is a lot easier than this one because I've you know, I've answered a lot of my you know I mean or I've had a lot of my answers my questions answered already well the thought the thought might be if nothing if six weeks gives us a baseline of understanding what the total cost of this is I think it'd be time well spent I, I think I think six weeks to get a baseline even if we decide price tag's too high or it's, the figures are outrageous. If nothing else to reflect upon going forward to have a baseline as to where we are, I think that's probably good. I guess we better get a quote, yeah. too. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. make but, sure. And I said percentage of how much you got. How much you charge us to do the three more studies. <laughs> well, I think how it is, too. I think we started this process we a year ago. Yeah, I know. So that, that's the thing that's yeah. churning in my head that I'm saying, I don't want to be here a year from now saying, yeah, that school study will be here any minute now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't disagree. I do think, I mean, elephant in the room. No, it's not the elephant room. I mean, we didn't know that we were going to be dealing with a pandemic while this was going on, too. Yeah, so there's a lot great. of, yeah, there's yeah. a lot of stuff that I think we all said, okay, we got, we got to, we got to prioritize. But yeah. so six weeks, you're going to, you need to get staff a quote on how much that's going to be. And then that would need, if it's over a certain amount, would going to be come back and come back to us. And then during that time, yeah, it's going to be six weeks from that time, you know. Right. So we're all, you know, we got to. What may be good if it's if it's possible if once y'all get that quote back, come up with a clear timeline for us that this is when the study is going to be done, this is when this is going to come to us in in either workshop or at the council. This is when you're going to set public hearings and stakeholder meetings, and then once it goes through that process, here's when you would be voting on enacting a an impact fee and that would give us a start to finish if that if that works it makes sense it might also line up pretty well to get all this stuff get all the information have all the public holds stakeholder meetings and all that might line up maybe line up for our retreat to be a retreat topic where we can sit down and talk good. through you know that might be a real good pressure and, and one other point too I didn't know this of course I think we're all learning through this process but I didn't understand that um, the information we ask for and the data specifically that we include is going to impact the information that we get back so I don't know how to ask this question but Craig you kind of talked about it like and I don't have this clear in my head but yeah we can look at a study on the schools if we operate based on how we've operated in the past I think I know what you mean I also think it's important to understand how do we figure out what that might look like moving forward I don't I don't know the answer to that you may not know the answer to that either um, so 
I want to get good information for us to make a good decision. So I don't really know what I'm asking. I just know that there's something out there I don't understand, and I don't want to get that report back and then say, oh, well, yeah, if we're not going to build one school, you know, every two years, then this information is meaningless, right? Am I kind of close? Yeah, no, I, I, I think. I think that's what he was struggling yeah, with. Yeah, that's what, right? that's what I was saying is that we don't. I'm just reiterating that. Yeah, so we I don't, don't know how to solve it. Um, yeah, other than other than having a policy discussion that is something the council wants to to take up on schools and hold on to that for a few years. I mean, we do we we're, we've kicked that around like the impact fee. We are going to have to have that discussion. You know, moving forward, we're going to have to have the discussion, knowing that we just spent forty million on this school plus development plus land. Mm -hmm. That number's a whole lot higher than probably 40 is, but we need to have the discussion, and maybe this is something as a council that we have the discussion and set sort of our expectations or what we would like to talk to the county about to really, if, if that discussion is, hey, we don't want to push it all off to you, we want to partner with you, you know, that may be, you know, there was a discussion on, on, um, on Salem, and I think we got a l into it a little too too late in the game, but there was a discussion about partnering with the county on on Salem. So it, instead of them spending seventy and us spending spending forty, that there's a way to have that partnership together. So that's going to be a discussion for another workshop. But it, it, it that is a big factor on what number comes in there. And, and I don't want to insult the process because I know this is a way oversimplification, but, you know, Salem was built in 17, 18, 19, 19. Yeah, overall was built in 15, 16, Salem was built in 19, 18, 19. And so I realize it may not be as simple of population count and overlay to the schools as we're going through that. So how are we growing and when are we building a school? It may, I realize it's not that simple, but if it may be helpful just to know um, this is how we have grown, this is what the past has looked like, and if we did continue to move forward, here's per household what that cost would be, and is, is everybody comfortable doing that, you know, moving forward? Because that may influence that conversation and help that conversation. It's it's a chicken and the egg thing here a little bit because he's waiting on us to tell. Yeah, I get it. To kind of say, well, what's your vision? Then I can go build out what this thing likely looks like. On the, on the other side, though, what I'll tell you is I think it'd be important for, like when I was talking about what wanting to know what that number is to help make decisions, I kind of do want to see what the number looks like going like we've been going. That's what I mean. Yeah. So that we know if we just keep on the same track doing what we've been doing for the last call it, 10 years, well, the, the, for the, the next 10. The, the, the anomaly is last year because it's I, unless you drop back and just forget last year because how are you going to get numbers from the school system? Do you assume the growth? Are you talking about the population numbers? Yes, yeah, numbers for how the school growth is going to impact it. The problem with the BEP right now and, and the, is the variance in the schools. And then the, some of the question, this is more nationally, is now that parents spent last year homeschooling, how yeah. many are going to think, are they gonna oh, come I can back. do this? I can do I mean, this. I'm not going to put my kids back in anymore. Any. Most of them are going Depends on the age of the child. There's seven. There's going to be seven yeah, that do that. That's, that, that, that's <laughs> right. national. <laughs> this sat, I guess it was this Friday night. I was at I was at Chewy's and I was talking to a local liquor store owner and talking about COVID. He's like, "Oh, my business is the best it's ever been." I'm like, well, that's one person. Yeah. We, we do need as we talk about the school discussion. I don't think this is just going to be an overall council discussion to add to our list of of joint meetings. You know, the school board is going to have to hear from the council. On what direction that we're going, you know, that we we want to go, and and yeah, I, I think it'd be appropriate for the for us to have a joint meeting with the school board and and the council, really, just to say and let them know. For example, if we just said, look, we don't, we're not interested. When we built Salem, um, when we built overall in fifteen, that school was twenty two million, twenty three million. I think that's right, Greg. I mean, it, it was. Salem was double what overall was to build the exact same school. And so if you look at that, and we're projecting on $40 million for 
2023, that number may be 70 million in 2023. So, I mean, I think what we have to really do for the from from the it's a tough discussion, but with the school board really to have, hey, here's where the council is on moving forward that you know, we can't afford to build a $70 million school in 2024 with all of these other infrastructures. So, I mean, it may be to push it back to the school board to say, how about y'all talk about some creative ways to partner with the county or whatever that 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 is is going to be for, for to come up with what that, that funding model is going to be. I mean, I don't even know where we'd find land to build a school right now. The county's still searching yeah, for land to build a school. The county's problem right now is I'm, on the I'm west side with, land. I'm good with yeah. talking about the chicken or the egg either way, frankly, guys. I mean, I, I, we obviously have to have a discussion about school sooner or later. I put it as a retreat topic, which I've already sent in. So, I mean, you know, that was something I thought was <clears throat> one of the things I think we need to talk about, too. So, hold on one sec. Look. Mr. Mayor, yes, uh, sir. Um, I just wanted to point out, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the, the discussion is with, about the schools, but I did want to point out, even if you're not going to build new schools, you can use impact fees to expand existing schools. Yeah. Okay. Just, well, we, we have a, I mean, I don't want to say it's a special school district, but we have our own. It's like Franklin. Sort of. Sure. But we don't have, with them, being a, yeah, with them being a special school district, they have taxing authority that we don't have. Gotcha. We, we ultimately are paying for sticks and bricks and <laughs> furniture fixtures and I mean we're we're giving it we're not giving we're providing everything and then the school board runs day-to-day -day operations hires and fires teachers and policies and procedures so I mean and ultimately our last bond issuance back in what is it Craig Craig 20% of our total debt is to schools right now is that For right our last my last bond yeah I can't remember the it's exact percentage. That's that's where we are. I got you. Let's look at it too. Oh, when we did, yeah, when we did uh, Salem, you mean? Yes. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So on that one, yeah. On that one, it was. Like, yeah. To recap, you guys are going to send a proposal. Craig, you're going to get that amount, and then let us know the t the exact timeline on we need on what oh, we need to have, timeline. and then hopefully in between that, while budget's going on, we need to have our retreat set where. We can give some direction, even once we know what that amount on schools is going to be, we can give direction from there and start the discussion with the school board on, on what's, you know, what's next. Um, okay, and then we'll, we'll wait on the uh, community meetings, I guess, until we have more. If we're going to have community meetings, we, we should have the numbers out yeah. fully that we're going to be considering, so we'll have to wait on those. I think that'd be better to okay. I mean I don't, I don't think we need to be adding numbers after we have the right you know I mean for sure I mean we just have to go back and do the community right. yeah if it's substantial yeah okay is that is that fair with everyone yep all right cool. how, how long might it take us to get your proposal a day or two okay work on it on the flight so that way if Craig, we, we possibly for next Thursday meeting, if it if it's over our threshold amount, could have that um, could have that to vote on, you know, to start our clock next. Well, it wouldn't be. Well, we can talk about time yeah. as far as our next meeting. Okay. Any other um, discussion on impact fees? Do y'all have clear direction? It's clear as mud. All right. <laughs> Okay, let's move to um, the yeah. MED. Um, what happened the other way? <laughs> <laughs> There's the rest you can. You can't hold us accountable if we make the... <laughs> <laughs> Smoke screening and whatnot. All right, so let's move to MED pre Proceeds Committee. We had, um, I think everyone got them, but we had eight... Uh, <laughs> we had eight different applicants. We had... Um, Andy Womack, who is a State Farm insurance agent. We had Eric Merriweather, a financial advisor. Denise Rucker, who serves on the Rutherford County Election Commission Board and is retired from State Farm. We had Jeff Rainwater, who uh, is with a healthcare company and works in budgeting and forecasting. Patrick Shearer, I, his application, I don't know what Patrick does. Does anyone? I think he works at Moab or is a business owner in Moab. Yeah. I, I kind of stopped him. A bike? Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Small uh, business owner. Yeah. Yeah. Is he on Moab? I think so. I think so. Yeah. 
or works there, or works there, yeah. Is the son of somebody that owns Moab or something? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Moab. I think Mark Demet owns Moab. I think that's I right. Yeah. 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 All right. So then we have Gabe Helms, who's a financial consultant and a CPA. Bob Mifflin, who is retired, former banker, and also managed the Christy Houston Foundation. Amy Fair, uh, who is an uh, attorney here in town, who deals in real estate, trust, estate, planning. And then Dee Jernigan, uh, I think everyone knows Dee, Parks and Recreation Commission, and also a financial advisor. Uh, we have the, our chair is Councilman Lalance. So we need to discuss from the council members, I think the ordinance is written, Adam, where I'm making recommendations, but I think we want it, or isn't that how it's written? Yeah, the, the mayor shall present the list of nominees at a regular meeting of city council for consideration. City council shall then select by majority vote the five nominees. It's actually going to be four. Four. Right. Up from the list. So instead of me picking eight people or four people, uh, I'm presenting to y'all eight people uh, that we can discuss uh, from the council. I think one of the things that we talked about is that we wanted people who had some type of financial background. I think it's one of the things that we talked about on, on discussing this. So I'm going to open the floor um, for discussion on these eight Applicants. And my plan is to abstain just so that I'm sort of out of that and you guys make the committee up and I'll work with you. Okay. Mayor, I'll, I'll lead us off. Um, I just want to say, kind of on the record, I, I had a lot of people call me that were interested in serving on this, in, in this group, on this commission. And um, I actually um, discouraged a lot of people who called me, not because they weren't good people, not because of anything other than I tried to really hold true to who we were looking for and uh, folks that had uh, specific expertise, whether it be CPA, legal, financial. And so there are a lot of good people that uh, wanted to serve. I'm very glad we had a lot of community interest in serving. Um, but I, I did want to say that, you know, as we go through this, my opinion on this is going to be very specific on if they do not have legal CPA or financial expertise, doesn't mean they're not good <clears throat> I'm just going to be very specific about who I support. Them. So I just want to say that because I had a lot of people call me and I had to tell them, hey, I'm not going to recommend you um, because you're great. I love you, but I don't think your skill set fits this. So. How are you going to do this, Mayor? I'll, however, I mean, hey, by the way, I yeah. didn't want to say in full disclosure. Um, I, I'm saying it for this. I did talk to Bob Mifflin. I did that two two weeks ago. As soon as we left here that day, <clears throat> I don't mind saying that. I mean, I, you know, I, after our conversation, I thought, well, maybe I've kind of backed away from it a little bit. But I did talk to him about this, and so just so y'all know. But I, y'all are making a decision on okay. I, and I, I mean, on, I, so on, let's take on that front. Just yes. to add a little bit. If you didn't get my email earlier, you have Bob Smith on here. This is just me filling this out on a little bit that I knew about him. His is in the mail. Yeah. For some reason, the mail has gotten worse and worse over the last several months. But uh, we'll get a full application on him. But I don't want anybody to think this was his application. That was yeah. just <laughs> putting them in half. Just to put names, like maybe four names, and then see if those four names win, or do you just want to us vote? And we can go I'm, however y'all want to do it. Open for whatever. Um, Along those lines, you know, a possible thing would be to kind of a rank order voting where everyone puts, you know, four names that ranks the four that they would most like to see. And, you know, if it's, you know, the what the, the four candidates that have the lowest total score sure. All right, would, so be, put, would put, be the people that are selected. Four gets it. So let's do this. Everyone, and I, I'm... So, so I'd have to ask, I, I guess I could have Madeline email me. No, I, let's just do it this way, if you don't mind. If, you'll, if every council member will write your name at the top of a sheet of paper, so that way everyone, it's just write your four, and if y'all want to pass them to me, I'll total them up, and then I'll give that to you to be able to put in the record so that way that will 
But, but Madeline has to send hers to me. Can she She's, can she text you? Yeah. She, yeah. yeah. Hey Matt. Hey Madeline. It's on it's on the way. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mayor, you mentioned there are eight. I have nine names. Okay. I just want to make sure everybody was included. I've got, I've got Dee Jernigan, Amy Fair, Bob Mifflin, Gabe Helms, Patrick Sher, Jeff Randwater, Dennis Schrucker, Eric Merriweather, Andy Womack, and who am I, who's the other one I'm missing? How many did you name? I have two. One. You said Patrick Sher. I did. Oh, wait. I put two fours on here. I'm sorry. Okay. So there sorry. are nine. Okay. I just want to make sure we weren't You're going to add up the number? Good Grandy County math. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not going to have them in, in uh, order. We're just going to put... Just put out. just put your Thanks. four on there, and then we'll... Um, so you would, you would need to rank your your first choice first, your second choice. Oh, that's what I was asking. He said yes. No. Yes. Put them in the order, yeah. one, two, yeah. three, four, four right? that you want them. Yeah. Yeah. Got so, I mean, it's still going to be the yeah. top four. So... <laughs> <laughs> Send four names over. Yeah. I'm going to tally them up before we start getting in order. And then if we have four that are common, then, you know, we don't oh, have okay. to. Okay. Yeah, that's true. All right, so Kurt. Bill, Sean, Ron. Okay. Uh, I voted off, by the way. I was like, y'all are done. Yeah, y'all are done, aren't you? I need your torch. Have you got all the names written down? Okay, I'm going I'm to call off, and if you'll, if you'll put a check mark. All right, so I've got uh, Gabe Helms. You got who? Helms. Gabe Helms. Okay. Bob Mifflin. Okay. Amy Fair. Andy Womack. Bob Mifflin. Jeff. Rainwater, Andy Womack, hey, Eric hey, Merriweather. Hang on, you're going too fast. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard the second, uh, the Jeff Rainwater. Who, who's after Andy that? Andy Womack. He's had two now, right? Yes. Okay. I'm with you. Eric Merriweather. Okay. Andy Womack. Okay. Andy Fair. Okay. Bob Mifflin. Okay. E. Jernigan. Okay. Eric Merriweather. Okay. Bob Mifflin. Okay. Amy Fair. D. Jernigan, D. Jernigan, Amy Fair, Bob Mifflin, and Eric Merriweather. Okay. What's that count? Have I have Madeline's. Okay. okay. What's okay. Yeah. Here. Oh, yeah. Too late now. Oh, that's okay. I can just give it to that's her. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just give it to okay. Melissa. These are all going to be public records yeah. anyway, so. We have Bob Mifflin has six votes. Okay. And then we have four. No, we have three with four votes. Andy Womack, Andy, Amy Ferrer, and Eric Merriweather. Okay, so will you read the, the three that have four votes? Amy Fair, Andy Womack, and Eric Merriweather. Okay, so one second. I'm gonna, it's four. That's four. Is that how many we needed? Yeah, we need four. So that's four. Okay, so read the read the total. The top vote was Bob Mifflin was uh, six, and then we have Andy Womack, Amy Fair, and Eric Merriweather with four. Okay, that's our committee. Good. I'm going to submit these for the record. Um, let's, so we've got Bob Mifflin, Eric Merriweather, Amy Fair, Andy Womack, and Councilman Lalance. So those will be the five. In that order. In that order. All right. Um, I have. Uh, we have any licensing? We do. Okay. We have um, a new location for a restaurant at 3053 Medical Center Parkway, Suite D. That uh, application is ready for issuance if you approve it today and the background check meets our requirements. 
Additionally, we have a new location for a restaurant at 452 North Thompson Lane, Suite C. That one has not finished their building codes inspections just yet. We have a restaurant with an ownership and name change at 451 North Thompson Lane. And we have a convenience store at uh, that's a new location, 1157 Fortress Boulevard. All of those need to finish up the building codes inspections, but they've met our requirements otherwise. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Mr. Wright, call the roll. Vice Mayor Skills Harris. Aye. Mr. Lalance. Aye. Mr. Martin. Aye. Mr. Shacklett. Mr. Wade. Aye. Mr. Wright. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. All right. Any statements? No, sir. Any bit other business from staff? Any other business from council? All right. So I wanted to ask, I thought this was really cool, and I'm not because I like to fly. We've had, you know, we've been talking about the Murfreesboro Airport for quite some time, really going back to, to now that we've got the terminal in place. But um, last Tuesday was the first full day that we had um, this new program called Vert, Vert Tower, Vert Tower um, in place. And we've been using statistics from a program called Flight Aware that most pilots will use to monitor air traffic. And... Um, Chad's going to explain to you that information and, and what you're looking at. But, Chad, will you – I thought this was unreal. I guess it was last Thursday or Friday that Chad sent us um, an email out. <coughs> and this Vertower monitors 29 airports. And out of the 29 airports that we monitor – or that they monitor, Murfreesboro Airport was the busiest out of those 29. And what I thought was even more uh, overwhelming was that we had more operations in Murfreesboro. So out of that, out of that traffic, 69% was MTSU. Um, so out of those 550 traffics, almost 70% was the university. But what even puts this in perspective, our airport here in Murfreesboro and, you know, what we've been talking about, noise and those things, this airport last Thursday was busier than uh, BNA. It was busier than Nashville. We had more traffics here than Nashville had for their entire day. So now this this the multiple touchdowns. Program chat will explain to you what it monitors, the touch and goes, but it puts everything uh, in perspective now on how Chad can like you can see the two planes that are taxiing right now, just because of the wind, everyone's I'm taking off, take off, headed south now. So anyway, Chad, go ahead and, and maybe explain. Well, everything. and this and this goes back to a conversation that we had back in in 2013 with the city council when we were looking at the runway extension, and and uh, one of the, one of the things that Vice Mayor uh, Harris asked is to have some sort of equipment that counts traffic that we can monitor traffic and the technology was just not available and it just now became available and we were the first ones in, in uh, Tennessee to pick this up and and what it does is now that aircraft have what is called ADSB uh, attached to their to their aircraft in the past what we've relied on nationwide and, and across the world is is radar to uh, be able to see aircraft as they fly and now we're going from radar and, and radio navigation to satellite based equipment and so what we're seeing here is those aircraft are submitting or uh, information to the satellites and that's coming back to us so, so that we can see the aircraft and what this program allows us to do is this is really about a second a second delay so if we were open those windows and we see one of those aircraft take off on this runway we'll see it almost real time across those windows this uh, it, it gives me a, a count as we go through the day when we started this meeting, we were at 135 operations. We're at 245 right now. And you can see that every aircraft as they land or take off is being recorded. And we can see, uh, for example, right here, 587 Mike Tango, it's a landing. 587 Mike Tango, that's a takeoff. Well, that's a touch and go. And we can, from that data, be able to see how, much, how many of our operations percentage-wise are touch and go. Um, and that's and that's a lot because of uh, we're all flight training. This also gives me a, an opportunity to uh, take a look. If I get a noise complaint from a neighbor, uh, I can put in a uh, 
uh, a location, the time, uh, a range of time or whatever, and it will plot out uh, that those operations for that day. And as it plots those, I can go to a specific track and uh, pick out which aircraft that was. It will give me the end number, it will give me the altitude and the time and everything like that. So we can see, for example, the other day, a helicopter came in low uh, and landed here for fuel, and we got a noise complaint right away coming in from uh, like the Northwoods area. We were able to pull it up, and it was 400 feet. It was below what helicopters should be flying. It was also Georgia Highway Patrol, so we didn't really hold them too bad. They, they have guns. <laughs> but we were able to find that out relatively quickly. And what this data allows us to do is uh, collect all kinds of, of information, real hardcore uh, specific information for our airport layout plans. We could take a look at how much of our of our base customers are using the, the runway. Like the mayor said, MTSU is calculating 60 to 70, some days 80% of our, of our operations. Um, what can we do to make it more efficient? Uh, there's all kinds of data that we can be gathering here. So I wanted y'all to see what Chad is is sending because I know you know I had again had a good conversation with Dr. McPhee last week. As a matter of fact, talked to him yesterday. He's just updating on you know what they're working on. But um, this really should give not only council members, the airport commission, um, you know, like you can see from today those circles that are around pattern and so that that really shows what we have talked about and what we even talked about at the last airport commission about planes not being in the pattern and when we say the pattern over homes the entire day um, and I know several of us got it got emails this past weekend and so what I've you know been doing is I don't have access to this but you can you know, at 6 o'clock in the morning, it's pretty easy to pull up the program and you can see, hey, there's seven planes in the pattern at 6, 6 10 in the morning. And, you know, at some neighbors, you know, the argument you're always going to hear is, well, you move next to an airport. Well, a lot of people move next to the airport at X, and now if we're at Y, then I think there is some, some things that we're going to, you know, continue to work on. But anyway, I wanted you all to see this, and as you get emails and get different feedback, that you can always send that to Chad and um, and be able to he can he can track all that. Let me ask a couple of questions. Who has access to this? Who who can pull this up? Basically anybody can, <laughs> and I'll be glad to I'll be glad to send you all that, that those passwords and everything like that. We have a display in the lobby. Um, in fact, we literally got this going uh, last week. Wednesday was about a half a day of of data. Um, the gentlemen that are behind this came in, flew in yesterday because they wanted to see what was going on here, mm -hmm. and now they are touring the airports uh, in Tennessee to try to, to ch try to sell this. Um, so the, the data to us is just invaluable. And this this one's pretty specific to the we, I can send a ADS exchange, which mm -hmm. is a little bit easier, uh, and it's publicly available. It's not we didn't pay, so anybody can pull it up, and then you can sort. It in. The instructions is very, you know, five or six clicks. You can see the pattern of the planes that are up there right now at any given time. So maybe I'll send them ADS, and then we don't have to worry about yeah violating whatever <laughs> licenses we have on. Well, and that was the other question: Is this a contract that's going to yes. end? That it, that it will end at a certain time, or is this something we're going to have here? We're going to take a look at it. It's it is uh, for a single runway like we have. It's five hundred dollars a month, uh, and and. It's, the, the the value of it is tremendous. I, I one of the the owner of this and the operator of it even talked about being able to find an aircraft that was down that they were having trouble finding because it it gave its last um, signal and they were within two miles of that and they were able to find it quickly. So it, it's it's uh, an amazing tool and I'm still learning. From it. Thank you, Chad, for working on that. I really appreciate that. Sorry, it took so long. Oh, that's okay. You did a great job. You did a great job. Thank you for working on that. It, it helps us now to be able to substantiate when Chad, you know, the way our local, our, the way our ordinance is written, it 
um, if the airport director at any time deems that there's a safety issue, um, he has or she has the, the straight ability per the code to be able to institute immediately things to be able to rectify that. So I think this gives him the ability now that you know we can look at these objectively and not taking a motion out. Hey, here's here's the data, and this is this is where we are. So. I can't wait to see the information that starts coming back off this, just that we can we can see it. I thought everybody would be astounded to know that we were busier than than Nashville <laughs> last last Wednesday or Thursday. Now it is touch and goes. I think it was 240 of those 550 traffics were touch and goes, but it still does not it still does not alleviate that is a plane that's taken off is taking off and landing in the pattern, um, yeah. which is, it doesn't matter if it's a 747 or if it's a Cessna, it's still a traffic in the in the airport. You can see it does impact our maintenance, of our runway maintenance, yeah. and so there's there's a cost to it. You can see the most dangerous areas are going to be the places where the lines are closest together, right? And that's obviously the biggest bottleneck is the runway. So a touch and go is going to, you know, is those count. Yeah, so this is a good example. This is what is in Lebanon right now. Chad, if you mm -hmm. want to show what's in Lebanon. So there's two, two. there's two planes in their, their area. So what may would be good is to go to uh, Gallatin. Yeah, there's Lebanon. Be sick. There's my farm. There's, <laughs> there's nothing in, the tra in, the, in, in Gallatin right now. And then... Chad, one of the discussions we have, you know where you're going, it would be good to go look south at Shelbyville. It's like lots of capacity. Yep. Then, Chad, go to Tullahoma. Wow. So when you clicked on that, did you see it's the other way? Uh, other direction. Oops, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so there's Telehome. I'll scroll it the other way. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go, Chad. There's, there's. Oh, so just keeps it there. <laughs> I mean, believe it or not, Telehome has got three runways. They have a grass runway, but there's no one at Telehome right now. And then I guarantee if you went southeast, there's no one in Winchester. And to put it in perspective, even in a Cessna plane, it will take you about seven minutes to fly to Tullahoma, and it'll take you about another six minutes to get to um, to uh, Tullahoma from. And the, the actual um, Chad John Glass, who's the he's the Chad of Tullahoma, is a graduate of MTSU, uh, the aerospace program. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it gives you good information to be able to see how busy our airport is compared to. Some of these others. Ah. Chad, is, your, is this an annual contract? Monthly. Monthly. So they, don't, they would only do monthly. We could do it annual. We'll, we'll see what savings there is. We we tried it really to get the first three months before the end of the budget year just to just to play with it, see how valuable it was. I would I would venture to say that's the cheapest it's ever going. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. Uh, for what it's worth, I had a conversation with Dr. McPhee yesterday, and he assured me that they're working on solutions and things. Don't know when and where or whatever. Some other people may have more information on that. He just did say that they were working on some solutions to try to try to help some of that stuff that we're hearing, complaints. Awesome. Chad, thank you for doing that. I, and, and you know, I, I, you know, talk about planning, you talk about... I don't know a department that's managed as much growth with as few employees as what Chad has. And so all the people out here who work are, are phenomenal. And Chad, over the last two months, I mean, you know Bill has worked on the airport commission for some time now, but the information that Chad can give you that's thoughtful and non-biased is just... Um, I just say, maybe. when you see somebody, it's not me, but the people that serve on our airport commission are fully vested in the work of the airport. They're, they're smart folks that have experience, and they're all work, work very hard. It's been impressive to watch them come to decisions, and some of the stuff that they have to chew over are extremely complicated, but they're all very committed. So if you see somebody on the airport commission, you need to commend them for the service. Uh, Steve Waldron and 
so many others. All right, any questions? Are we meeting next week, Chad? I mean, Craig? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I know we're meeting on the 25th because of the uh, public hearing. Okay. I, I, I'm well, just we have, we'll have to wait and see if we get anything on this. Yeah, we have spring break next week. So, you, yeah. we meet, I haven't seen anything come in yet to meet for next week, and so uh, Kenny's not here. But. Scott, I would really appreciate you not publishing that we're going to be on spring break next week so every criminal in Murfreesboro won't show up. <laughs> 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 Legislative session tomorrow, right? Oh, yes, yes, the legislative yeah, four, meeting tomorrow at 4 o'clock. Right here. Right here. Right here. Right here. Hey, uh, speaking of that, if if, if y'all get a chance, it would probably be good if you have any questions. Um, I know rep, we've been emailing back and forth with Darren, but Representative Terry has got a bill that's coming, um, is, is going to the floor. Senator White's carrying it, but it has to do with some solid waste things. So it may be good that if y'all talk some between now and tomorrow, maybe spend some time or just call Darren and let him explain to you some of the things that um, they've been dealing with with the landfill and you know the, the emails that we're consistently getting on the landfill, but maybe questions that we would be ready to ask them uh, tomorrow on, on that. Or any other Is questions? Brian going to be there? Yeah, Brian should be here tomorrow. I think everyone's going to be here. Um, Everyone agreed that they would be here, right, Craig? Uh, I think so. We were waiting on <coughs> one or two just to confirm last minute, but I think it sounds like most of them are going to be yeah. here at least. Are we going to ask him if he's going to apologize for accusing our uh, sewer? <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just we'll wait from him first. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> other good point. Hey, somebody brought it up at the last meeting, and I went and, and uh, tested it out, but since we're right here close by, if you hadn't been down Alexander Boulevard, take a ride out of here and make a loop around and cruise down through there and check out the uh, the speed humps. Um, just see just see what you think about it. I will tell you that my uh, uh, coworker of mine who lives in the neighborhood, there's a neighborhood Facebook group. I I sent uh, I sent a, a screenshot that she sent to me. Um, you know, we we all the time get a lot of complaints about just everything. You know, it's a a yin and yang, right? Some people happy, some people not, or whatever. But it was a really nice bunch of comments in a row about being able to walk their dogs and have their kids out in their yards and stuff like that on Alexander. So just pass that along, you guys. It, you know, I mean, it's it's nice to see those kinds of things. Maybe that'll be how this thing ends up. Who knows? Chris, how many? How many? I was talking about this on WGNS this morning. How many roads or streets are we up to of people that have emailed asking to be? Well, I'd say at least fifteen. Scrolling uh, every day. <laughs> Yeah, I just put something on social media saying, hey, if you've got a street issue, and I, I mean, it's just like email after email. I mean, the same streets are coming back of people saying, check this one, check that one. But it's, uh, Chris is keeping a database on all that so we can we can discuss it. There was one lady that lives on Haynes Haven, right where the back entrance to Northfield, where there's a pretty sharp curve right there, and she's had two cars go through her house. So that's one that... Uh, Chris went out and researched and met with her. So lots of lots of good information. All right, we'll stand adjourned.